Hey everyone, one of the best EuroLeague scorers is visiting Kona Stratton Hotel and Baskets New Stocks. Marcus Howard, ladies and gentlemen, hello to the show. Appreciate it, thank you for having me. Marcus, uh, you're known as one of the best scorers uh, in the EuroLeague. This is your, your go-to uh, card uh, here in the competition, even if we're only a few months into the season. And I just put the list of your career highs in five different competitions. And I'll name your single game career highs in, in, in points court. So NCAA 53, ACB 34, EuroLeague 33, NBA 25, and G League 19. And probably you hear that there's this popular topic where it's easier to score, NBA or EuroLeague. But I will try to do your uh, task a bit more difficult. Can you rank those five leagues from the easiest Ooh. to the most difficult to score? Oh, that's a bit... I'll go... I'll go from easiest. The easiest would definitely probably have to be the NBA. Okay. Um, NBA, then G League. Um, the NBA, there's so much space. And, you know, the guys that play, you know, at that level, um, you know, all the five that are on the court, they command so much attention. So um, there's a lot of space, you know, to find open shots and then, you know, be able to create. Um, the G League, it's a little bit more tougher. I mean, there's still that space that the NBA has, but um, it's still a little bit... Um, a little bit less less organized in terms of a basketball standpoint. Um, then honestly, um, I'd have to say Euro Euro League is very tough to score in. Um, ACB is extremely tough as well. Um, so I'd have to say Euro League than ACB because ACB, I mean, um, Euro League is very physical, but ACB, I think you know the refs let a lot mm. of things go, and that definitely brings that physicality brings a different level to the game. So. Um, yeah, and then um, I think, oh, college. Yeah. I would say college, I would put college after NBA and G League. You mm -hmm. know, it's, I think being here in Europe is the toughest to score here in Europe just because um, the teams lock into you so much, um, not only personally, but, you know, as a team. Um, all the teams are prepared. Um, there's a, a lot less space. Um, and then also, you know, just the speed of the game. It's so much different than how it's played in the United States. So um, Europe's been, you know, a great experience for me. It's been challenging, um, but you know I've enjoyed being able to embrace it. How much time it took for you to explain to your coaches what is a good shot and bad shot for you? Uh, I, th I think we're still trying to figure that out. <laughs> you know, um, if it goes in, I mean it's a great shot. But you know, for me, um, it's one of those things where you know as I get, continue to get more comfortable with the coach and he understands me and how I play, um, you know. I let him kind of decide that, but you know, for the most part, you know, Coach Penaroy, you know, has allowed me to play um, extremely free. So I'm fortunate for my first stint here in Europe to be with him and with Basconi. And that's that's the thing we actually discussed with our colleagues, with some other players. That what if you, for example, uh, landed in teams like Fenerbahce or some other teams where coaches are more strict in in terms of giving less freedom to some players? So can you get, get us through your decision making process when you decided to go to uh, Basconi? Um, personally, you know, I think um, you know my agents did a lot of research. You know, I did research as well, and just seeing the track record that Basconi had with you know players that were imported from the states. Um, and the success that those players have had, you know, the play styles that they play at um, are very similar to mine. You know, guys like Shane Larkin, Mike James, um, you know, they play very similar. I play very similar to, you know, how they play. And um, I thought that was very intriguing, you know, um, with the organization and having the opportunity to come here. Um, but, you know, with other teams, too, I mean, it's just um, in terms of me, they have to understand the type of player I am, you know, and if I fit their team, great. But if not, um, you know, uh, I'm fortunate, you know, that Basconia, you know, was intrigued by my game and, you know, I'm happy to be here. Who would be your top three EuroLeague scorers so far you've faced or you've met? Definitely Mike James, um, Shane Larkin, and then um, Will Clyborne. You know, those mm -hmm. three guys, um, they just command such, you know, uh, astounding presence when they're on the court and they command a lot of attention, but... Um, yeah, just being able to be on the court and compete against those guys this year um, has been eye-opening, you know. So it's been a lot of fun to be able to compete against high-level talent like that. You've, you're only one of few guys in the history of NCAA who scored 50-plus points in three straight uh, seasons. Can you get us through the following day when you put more than 50 uh, points in the NCAA 
was how the campus looks like how your phone uh, looks <laughs> like what's the all the hype uh, around you it's really hectic um you know um for it to happen three consecutive seasons you know people expected things like that but for me i mean i just go out there and play to the best of my ability and um you know to be able to do that in college um was awesome and you know but playing for the coach i did um he never allowed me to you know get comfortable or you know feel as though um it was something for me to be satisfied with you know he was um you know a coach that challenged me each and every day um so i was fortunate to play for steve ojahowski who played at duke and played for coach k and um you know he's a really tough coach to play for in terms of he wants the best for his players and he pushes them really hard so for me um it was great you know as a player to you know have games like that but um he was a big stickler on you know being able to move on to the next you know for me just being able to um have games like that but then not stay too locked in on that so i could move on to the next was really big for me you know because you don't want to be too high or too low when you're playing you want to stay even keel and that was something that he always taught um you know preached to me you know throughout my four years in college so um he allowed me to you know remain calm you know and just you know move on to the next and be able to um sustain that level of play i always wondered how it hits the players head when for example you're the superstar of NCAA you're scoring in such tempo and such pace like f- just few guys did uh, in the history there's this huge hype in campus college atmosphere and you can kind of feel a su- superstar and then let's say you're not getting drafted in the first round you're not getting a- chances in the NBA as you feel it that you deserved and some other players also saying hey this guy deserved more chances in that league and then you're on, on the plane to, to Europe how it hits uh, your head how do you handle this huge change I mean for me I look at everything as a blessing you know and um, there's a lot of things that are out of my control um, but one thing I can control is my attitude my effort and you know what I do each and every day to prepare myself you know to play and put my best foot forward and um, to be able to be here in this league you know it's a different challenge for me um it's been you know one that i've embraced and enjoyed and you know hasn't it hasn't been easy you know being able to make a transition of game in the united states to the game here hasn't been easy but you know i've had good people in my corner that have helped me along the way um and everything that's happened to me at this point you know i use as motivation you know from what i did in college to what happened in the nba even till now you know i'm still using you know the motivation of what got me to this point and you know what i know i'm capable of doing um just because you know I, i understand the type of player i am i know how hard i work and you know i understand the things that i can do so for me it's all just about continuing to get better each and every day and you know uh bloom where my feet are planted you know where i'm at right now in the present moment just trying to be the best me i can be speaking of having the right people on your corner i was told that michael porter jr was your roommate yeah. for most of the time in denver yeah what was the best advice what was the best conversation on what was the best thought you took from all those conversations yeah, my first year in the nba you know me and him had the opportunity to, you know to live together and um, me and him are very similar in age he's about a year older than me so um for us you know we were guys you know that went through a lot of the same things from high school you know to the nba um he definitely had a different path than i did but you know for me Um just being with him every day in the gym, you know, just seeing how he worked and you know, and a player of his stature and of his pedigree and still continuing to work no matter what. Um a guy who had positions of starting, you know, to a guy who'd been injured a lot. Um I saw him at the highs of highs and the lows of lows, so um for me, you know, a guy like that just seeing how he came to work each and every day with an intent to get better, whether he was playing or whether he was rehabbing. Um he was just a consummate professional. You know, so just seeing a guy like that who I can relate to a lot just with my age and seeing how he dealt with, you know, a lot of things that either went good for him or didn't go good for him, just to see his reaction to those, you know, was definitely big for me. The other guy who said an example was of course Nikola Jokic. Mm-hmm. What was the best and worst quality of Jokic? I think with Nikola, man, uh, you know, he doesn't say much, you know, but I think I mean as everybody can see from the outside looking in I mean his game and his presence you know speak louder than words you know so for him just seeing how he works so diligently each and every day um you know is definitely a big influence not only for myself but for everyone in that locker room um you know there, you can't you can't say enough good things about him man you know there's a reason why he's a two-time MVP in my opinion going to be the third third time um he just makes everyone around him better you know when you have a guy that that's that's that talented but still makes everyone around him better 
it's hard, you know, to really nitpick something that, you know, he isn't that good at. So, um, you know, still, you know, just being a guy that's a fan, you know, away from the team and everything, you know, I still root for those guys on that team and for him specifically, you know, because, you know, first and foremost, he's a great guy. So, you know, I root for, for him and, you know, that team's success. We have a couple questions from your fans, from Euroleague fans. Mm -hmm. These are Basket News uh, Plus members, our subscribers. So Nikos Manaras uh, has a question. Which teams would you single out as the most difficult to beat this year? You know, I, I think for us, especially, you know, being in Euroleague and ACB, we see those teams that we play four times in the year, like, you know, Valencia, Barcelona, Madrid. Um, so I think seeing teams like that, you know, more than just the regular two, like normal Euroleague teams is extremely tough, um, you know, because every game, it's not necessarily about, you know, the talent, it's about who can really think the game out better, you know, so playing get teams like Barcelona and Madrid um, four times a year can be extremely tough, but um, every game, you know, has presented different challenges, you know, um, so I mean, we're still, we still have a long way to go in the season, so I'm looking forward to more competition, but I would say the teams that we see, you know, more than just the two times are really tough to play against. And the second one goes from Milos Paskash. Uh, which teams you see as Basconia's biggest rivals for top eight? Hmm. It's kind of the same answer. I mean, those teams that are in Spain, you know, I mean, we see them a lot. So those are definitely rivals in itself. Um, but, you know, teams that are doing really well this year, you know, I think Fenerbahce and, you know, Olympiacos. Olympiacos beat us at home this year. So um, I know we're looking to play a better game against them. I mean, they're one of the best teams um, in EuroLeague and, you know, deservingly so. They've been playing great this year. And, um, you know, that's a team I think we're looking forward to being able to play against, you know, when the time comes. How do you think Facundo Campasso will change the picture of Red Star? And I believe that you're facing them when he will be available to play. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I just love um, Faku, man. I mean, in my time in Denver, you know, he was one of the guys I was closest with and I learned so much from him in two years. and. Me and him would always work out together, you know, play against each other in three on three, you know, each and every day. And um, he's one of the be most talented, best players I've played against, you know, and he made me better in so many ways. So to be able to play against him now, um, to have the opportunity to do that, um, especially with a team like Red Star, who's playing really, really good basketball and to be in an atmosphere like that, um, it'll be a lot of fun. I know I'm gonna be excited to see him. He'll be excited to see me. So. It'll be a lot of fun. I know that game will be uh, really, really exciting. Just for the last question, I mean, Basconia is probably one of the most fun teams to watch. You play high-paced basketball. I'm, I was actually shocked that Rokas Gedratis is the oldest guy on the roster, although he's like only 31. Yeah. Uh, you can clearly see that there's a great chemistry between uh, you guys. Coming from the NBA environment, from, from United States, what was the most unusual maybe for you watching those guys, watching this group and what stories maybe describes how, why and how and why this group is so special? I think for me, I, th I think a big difference, you know, I see from NBA to being here in Europe, I think there's a closer camaraderie with teams, you know, I think it reminds me a lot of when I was in college, you know, just being around the team a lot, having meals with the team, um, having guys that, you know, really wanted to spend time with each other. Um, I think for us and our team, I think there's great chemistry on the court because off the court, you know, we like to do stuff together, you know, and during holidays and everything, you know, we gather each other's families and we're all getting together for dinners and stuff like that. So um, it's a great group to be around. You know, we have great leadership and, you know, Rokas being our captain and other guys that are older that have experienced playing in Europe. Um, for guys that have been their first or second year, like myself, Dalton, Mike being our first year in EuroLeague, you know, they've really um, showed us the ropes and, you know, have been great leaders and uh, have really made it uh, an important part of our team to be able to get together outside of, you know, what we do on the court. So I think what people see on the court is um, reflected to, you know, how we view each other off the court. That was Marcus Howard. Thanks for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.